Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Amen. Welcome to each and every one of you on this, I guess a hint of winter day, isn't it? Yes. Down south here is a lot worse than it is up north. We had nothing. But anyway, welcome anyway as we uh, worship our Lord and Savior. We uh, trust that you will be blessed by the service today as I'm sure we will be bringing glory and honor to our Lord and Savior. In the way of announcements, a big thank you to everybody who helped pack the Christmas shoe boxes. I noticed a few more came in this morning. Um, they are to be at the church by November 16th, and that's when they will be delivered to Hanover. The next ladies' auxiliary meeting will be November 23rd at 1 o'clock. Mary Wynn going to teach us how to make angels. Elsie going to teach us how to make cards. All ladies are welcome, whether you're a member of the auxiliary or not, please come. Craft dinners. We have until when? Nobody knows when. Okay. We have until then to get them in here. The present times, Jim counted this morning, 796. And I think our goal is 2,341, isn't it? <laughs> okay, our goal is 900. So uh, a little way to go yet, but uh, we're doing very well. Thank you to everybody who has brought them in. This time I would like to leave you in our prayer of invocation. Father, in our call to worship, we are called to trust you and not on our own personal preferences. We are to humbly submit to you and follow the path you have set before us with the Holy Spirit's help and guidance. You, O oh Lord, have blessed us through this past week and have once again called us into a fellowship of saints to praise and bring honor and glory to you. To prepare for today's service, we will stop for a few minutes of silent personal prayer or meditation, aligning our thoughts with yours. Peace, your peace, which we heard about in last week's message. We ask it to fill our hearts and minds as we worship through, through songs, prayers, our offerings, and listening to the message entitled, Beginnings, the First Christian Sermon. A sermon filled with power of the Holy Spirit, telling them and us the plain truth of God's redemption plan and our salvation. Bless Pastor Ted as he brings us this message, challenging us and giving us peace if we but follow you and proclaim you as Lord of our lives. Father, bless all the aspects of this service bring, that is bringing glory to you, our Lord God Almighty. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Our first song this morning is all praise to our redeeming Lord. We ask you to stand as you are able. Be seated. I'd like to offer a prayer for the offering that has been taken up. Shall we pray? Father God, we come to you to thank you, Lord, for all the benefits we have of living in a country that is so overflowing with more than we need. We thank you, Lord, that we can give back to you. We thank you for this fellowship that continues to lean on you, that continues to trust you. And Lord, as we go through the week ahead, we ask that you continue to help us financially as we also look to you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Responsive reading this morning is Psalm 16, verses 1 through 9 and verse 11. I have to lead you in the responsive reading at this time. 
Keep me safe, my God. In you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who are not after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood on to such gods or take up their name on my lips. The Lord be alone in my portion and my help. You make my walks secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. Oops, sorry. I will praise the Lord who counsels me even at night. My heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. You make, make known to me the path of life. Amen. Here I am, Lord, number 589. The answer to stand as you are able. Please be seated. It is my privilege to once again lead you in our pastoral prayer. Shall we pray? Father, we just sang, Here I am, Lord. It is I, Lord. I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. Powerful words that are enough to make us stop and reflect. Do we really mean what we just sang? The answer is yes. If we let you hold our hand, and we follow where you lead and try not to go our own way. What a blessed assurance we have of your chosen children being guided by the same unchanging Holy Spirit that prompted Peter to speak as we will hear in today's Bible message or Bible passage. We are not our own but belong body and soul to Jesus our Redeemer, Creator and Friend. Oh, the joy we have as Christians knowing that nothing can separate us from you. For you are the potter, and we are the creation you created out of clay. Each day you give us is another day we can praise you or ignore you. Thank you, Father, for guiding us in seeking opportunities to bring the good news and to bring glory to you through it. Through this past week, you and you only, O oh Lord, have kept us safe in all of our activities. We thank and praise you for your care. We ask you to be with our loved ones and friends who are in retirement and nursing homes. What a blessing it is when you surround them in love and grace. We thank you for continued good health. Be with our members and friends who are not well, whether they are under doctor's care, in hospitals, or healing at home. Continue to comfort those who feel a very real pain in the loss of loved ones, even though we know they are being held in your hand. Father, we pray for the, world, for the world and local political leaders. Direct and guide them to lead from a humanistic and fair standpoint and not put selfish and personal gain as their goal. We pray for Dan and Shannon and their family visits. Father, Calm our busy minds. Keep our thoughts from wandering. Help us to focus on today's message. We love you, our blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, and worship to glorify you. We pray through the power of the Holy Spirit and in Jesus' precious name. Amen. This time it is my privilege to invite Ted up to the pulpit to once again give us the message that God has laid on his heart.
It is good to be uh, back in Wyerton once again. Um, it, it seems to me that our, our God is always full of surprises. Last Sunday morning, I was not expecting to be here this week. But nonetheless, here I am, um, sharing God's word with you. Um, so when I was asked to be here, I uh, had to scratch my head what, uh, what text would we look at this morning? Uh, what would the theme be? Um, and uh, so I turned to a, a section of scripture that the uh, small group of us are studying. Um, we're studying, we're looking at the book of Acts, just started looking at the book of Acts. And so it seemed very natural to, to look at Acts chapter 2. Um, not only are we studying the book of Acts in the small group in the church that we are attending, um, we have begun a course in uh, personal evangelism. And uh, that rings a bell with what is in Acts chapter 2. So we want to hear um, the words of Acts chapter 2. Um, in our scripture readings, so if you would like to look in your Bibles at Acts chapter 2, if you have access to a Bible, um, we're going to begin at verse 14. Um, I would have liked to have read the whole thing. I'm going to read a considerable chunk anyways. I would have liked to have read the whole thing. The whole chapter of, of Acts chapter 2 is focused on the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the church and the beginnings of the church itself. So let's, let's hear Acts chapter 2. We're going to begin at uh, verse 14 and to read to verse 41. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will turn to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over by you, by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it is impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope, because you will not abandon me, to the realm of death. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made, me, made known to me the paths of life. You fill me with the joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can confidently tell you that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. 
Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of death, nor did his body see decay. God raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to their hearts and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. May God bless this reading of his word. As I was uh, thinking about what I would call the sermon, um, because I was asked for information about um, scripture and sermon titles and all that sort of stuff long before the sermon was beginning to take shape in my mind, um, I call this beginnings because this is the beginning, the passage is about the beginning of the church. And then I called the, the message itself the first Christian sermon because here we have the first sermon preached by one of the followers of Jesus after the coming of the Holy Spirit. And when we think about firsts, we see them all around us. If we are familiar with little babies, we remember, you know, baby's first word, um, first time the baby rolls over, first step, first day at school, all those sorts of things. They're always firsts in, in every person's life. And in the existence of the church, there had to be a first sermon. And here we have, recorded in the book of Acts, Peter's sermon that he gave on that day of, of Pentecost. The focus of the chapter is actually upon the sermon. We have the beginning part that we'll refer to in a few minutes. We have the beginning part that talks about how the Holy Spirit came upon the church. Um, the people gathered in the upper room. And uh, we also have at the end of the chapter, uh, it's like a summary statement of, of the life of the church in the early days of the church. And in between, we have this sermon that Peter preached. And this sermon was an effective evangelistic sermon. How can we say that it's effective? Before this sermon was preached, the church was just a small group. The book of Acts tells us that there were 120 people, about, about 120 people, meeting in the upper room, praying and waiting. At the conclusion of this sermon, it says that about 3,000 people, about 3,000 new believers were added to their number that day. Now I want you to know, I, 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 um, I didn't do what Jim was doing this morning with pencil and paper and counting um, um, macaroni and cheese boxes. Um, I uh, grabbed my calculator and said uh, 3,000 divided by 120 and 
The arithmetic is 25 new believers for every single believer that day. Can you imagine the baptismal service they had that day? They must have been just a long line. And probably all of the, the apostles were probably baptizing new believers that day. What a scene. How, how would the church incorporate all of these new believers all at once? Can you imagine um, a small group like, like that are gathered here this morning, and then the word of the Lord comes upon the town of Wyerton in a mighty way, and the whole town of Wyerton is saved, and they all become part of Frank Street Baptist Church. How would we cope with so many new believers, babes in Christ, happening all at once. But that is what happened on that first day of Pentecost. Now in the sermon that Peter preached that day, there are, basically there are three sections. Um, the first section is an explanation of what had happened. So those first 13 verses of Acts chapter two, people were confused. So an explanation, and that's in verses 14 to 21. Second, there is a proclamation of the gospel message, and that's in verses 22 to 36. And third, there is a call to repentance with the promise of blessing, and that's in verses 37 to 41. Now, I didn't read the first part of Acts chapter 2 because it's one of those stories that's familiar in the life of the church, the first day of Pentecost. The 120 were waiting in the upper room for the fulfillment of Jesus' promise. Now, I just want to remind you what Jesus had said to them. And listen to his words. He says, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised. In a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. One of the things that strikes me as interesting about this is Jesus had told his followers to wait, and then after he told them that, he ascended into heaven. But he told his followers to wait, and they actually waited. They didn't go wandering off. They didn't say, oh, this is taking too long. Um, what is this Holy Spirit anyways? I don't understand, and, and wander off. No, they waited in the upper room. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and it came upon them with, the sound of the rushing wind, and with tongues of fire resting on each one of the believers that were gathered in that upper room. And then the Holy Spirit enabled them to speak in languages that they did not know, declaring the wonders of God. The scripture doesn't tell us this, because they were meeting in a room. A room that would have been probably smaller than this room. A hundred of them, twenty of them in one room. They didn't have COVID restrictions, so they could be closer together. Um, they must have spilled out into the streets, down from that upper room, out into the streets of Jerusalem. They probably were streaming towards the temple because the uh, nature of the sermon suggests that a large crowd uh, gathered to hear Peter, and there were very few places actually in the city of Jerusalem where a larger crowd could gather together. One of those places where you could gather a large crowd was on the steps of the temple. So they were probably came down from the upper room, praising God in languages that they did not know, and gathered at the steps to the temple, praising, praising the Lord, And people were listening. And while they may not have known the language that they were speaking, the people that were in Jerusalem 
knew the languages that they were speaking. They were speaking actual languages. And people from all over the world who had gathered in Jerusalem for Pentecost, and there is actually a list of the places, or at least some of the places, where these people had come from. People who had gathered from all over the world heard the praises of God in their own native language. There was a mixed response to this sign that God was at work. The scripture tells us that they couldn't understand how Galileans would know how to speak in their own native language. And some wondered, what does this mean? Now, that's a very natural question. When we see something we do not understand, we say, what does this mean? I don't understand. Give me more information. Help me to understand. Some asked that question, but others ridiculed them. They've had too much wine to drink. So Peter's sermon begins with an explanation of what has just happened. Now, as a side note, as I was thinking about this uh, particular sermon, um, Peter had no opportunity uh, to plan or prepare ahead. This sermon was given in, in response to an unfolding situation, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter begins to speak. And Peter dismisses the claims that they are drunk. He says, that, that's, that's not possible, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. No one would be drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. Instead, Peter says, what they had witnessed was the fulfillment of Scripture. Peter uses the Old Testament. It was the only Bible that the early Christians had. There was no New Testaments. They couldn't turn to a gospel and say, this is what Jesus said. This is what Jesus did. They didn't have any of the letters. The only Bible they had was the Old Testament. And he used the Old Testament in support of his sermon. His sermon was not just his own idea. What was happening in their midst was the fulfillment of prophecy. Peter quotes the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. It speaks of the last days, and it speaks of God's Spirit being poured out on all peoples. What was happening in their midst was not something that was new or unknown. It was promised in God's Word, and it was now being fulfilled in their midst. The gift of speaking languages, like happened on that first day of Pentecost, is an exceptional gift. Those 120 believers who, received, who first received the Holy Spirit were able to speak in languages that they did not know. Missionaries today would wish that they did not have to spend so much time and effort into learning languages, but they have to do that. The interesting thing is, those believers who were speaking in different languages could not have listened to someone tell them something in that language. They were able to speak the language, but they couldn't understand what was being spoken. So it was, it was a one-way opportunity. But missionaries wish that they did not have to spend so much time in learning language, but they have to. The lasting gift that was given that day when the Holy Spirit came is that God's Spirit was poured out on God's people and they would be enabled to be Jesus' witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and all Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
That's an explanation of what had happened on that first day of Pentecost. But that's just the first part of the sermon. Peter moves on. Peter begins this second part in verse 22. It runs to verse 36. It begins with a call to pay attention to what is about to be said. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. If they did not listen that day to what Peter was about to tell them, they risked being on the wrong side of history. When God speaks, it is important that we listen and respond to the message of the gospel. We must listen intently as well. Peter then calls his listeners to remember what Jesus had done among them. He says, Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Peter is asking those who are listening to him that day to remember things that Jesus had done in his earthly ministry. It is only 50 days since the crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's only 50 days. It's only three years since the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. And at least some of the people who were gathered there in Jerusalem that day would have been present and seen Jesus in the flesh. They would have seen the signs, the wonders, and the miracles. They were witnesses, too, of what had happened. And even if the people who were gathered there that day, on that first Pentecost to hear the sermon, even if they hadn't seen in the flesh what Jesus had said and done in those days of his ministry on, in Palestine, they would have heard all about Jesus because they would have had friends and family who would have seen Jesus and come back. And you should have seen what Jesus did today. He fed 5,000 people with a young boy's lunch. How is that possible? Or they would have said, we saw Jesus walk on water on the Sea of Galilee. We saw the lame man healed. They knew because they had either seen or they had knew, uh, known people who had seen what had happened. We don't have the same closeness to the events uh, that those first hearers of this sermon had, but we have something else. We have the scriptures. We have a historic, accurate account of the eyewitnesses of those events back in those days. And we can look at the gospel and we can see that Jesus indeed has come from the Father. He is fully accredited. He is a man sent by God. This Jesus, who was fully accredited by God, was put to death on a cross. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. We see here what can only be called a complicated situation. You see, it was God's plan. All along, from the foundation of the world, it was God's plan that Jesus would be led out and crucified at Calvary. All along it was God's plan. God knew it was going to happen. And he put into, into effect the events that would lead to that moment in history. But while saying that, that it, it, it was God's plan all along that Jesus would die, 
Peter says the people who were listening were also responsible. They, it says, you, along with other wicked men, put Jesus to death by nailing him to a cross. Unless we think that we can blame someone else for killing Jesus, unless we think that it's someone else's responsibility, it's not mine. I remember a sermon that I heard years ago where the preacher was asking the question, who killed Jesus? And he worked his way through a long list of people who could have been responsible. Was it the priests? Was it Pilate? Was it, you know, down this long list. And ultimately, when he came to the end of the sermon, his conclusion was that we were all responsible. It was my sin that caused Jesus to be nailed to the cross and die in my place. So we see in this sermon, Peter says, it is God's plan, and, but also humans are responsible. It fits together. Both are true. Peter goes on to say, Jesus' body was not left to rot in the tomb. God raised him from the dead. And it says in the scripture, God raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses. Now you notice there's a distinction here. Before we had God's plan and humans working to kill Jesus. But now we have God acting alone to raise Jesus to life. The role of Jesus' followers in all of this is simply that of witnesses. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us, For I received what I passed on to you of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to more uh, than 500 of the brothers and sisters at one time. Now this little summary that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 sounds very familiar to this sermon, doesn't it? Peter has begun, Jesus was crucified. He was buried. He was raised to life. And that's exactly what Paul says. This is the core of any gospel message. Jesus died for our sins. He was buried, was raised to new life. And this is the core of any gospel message. And the last idea that we'll just mention briefly is that Jesus has ascended to heaven sits at the right hand of the Father. And the evidence that this has happened is that God has poured out his Holy Spirit upon his church. And the outpouring of the Spirit has produced the events that the people in Jerusalem had witnessed that day. Peter concludes his message with these words. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and and Messiah. This is Peter's message on that first day of Pentecost. It is short. It is to the point. It reveals Jesus as the one who has come to save his people from their sins. The last section of the sermon is this. It is a call to repentance and the promise of blessing. And it comes after the initial response of the people to what they have heard Peter say. So this was not a sermon where Peter stood up and talked and talked and talked and then sat down and people sang a hymn and went out. So as Peter presents his final conclusion that uh, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus both Lord and Messiah. People respond. And the initial response is this. When people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to the Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? It indicates a keen awareness 
of their own sinfulness. God had sent the oft-promised and long-awaited Messiah, but instead of welcoming Jesus as the Christ, they had participated in his crucifixion. They knew at that moment that they had rejected God and they had rejected God's offer of salvation because they had ignored Jesus while he walked among them. I shared a little bit earlier that at the Newstead Baptist Church we have begun a course by Kirk Cameron and Ray Comfort called The Way of the Master. And it is about how we can share our faith and be witnesses for Jesus. And one of the things they emphasize as we communicate with other people is the need to appeal to the conscience instead of the intellect. And their approach to dealing with this is to use the law, to point out to people that they have sinned. And so often, if you, you can see videos by Ray Comfort on YouTube, and he will present the gospel in a way that is something like this. Have you ever, have you ever told a lie? Have you ever stolen anything? Have you ever looked at another person with lust in your heart? Those are the questions that you hear him often ask people when he stops them to talk about his faith. And he is bypassing the intellect and speaking to the conscience. And it raises the question, who needs a savior? And you see, a good person doesn't need a savior. Why do you need a savior if you're good? The problem is our, our standard of good is so variable. And I think I, in uh, one of the classes that we were at, I, I shared that the, how many times have you gone to a funeral? And people will say, well, he, he, was a good, he was a good man. She was a good woman. How often do you go to a funeral and say something like that or hear something like that? But we could all be described as good. It just depends who we compare ourselves to. Does it not? Unless you're the absolute worst person that has ever lived in the world. You can find somebody that you say, well, well I'm not that bad. I might have been angry with my brother, but I, I didn't kill him. I might have said hurtful things about my sister, but I didn't really mean them. We can define good in so many ways, but a good person doesn't need a savior. Only a sinner needs a savior. And in preaching a sermon that day, the sermon that Peter preached, he made that crowd of Jews who were gathered on the steps outside of the temple and who heard him that day, he made them keenly aware of their own sin. He didn't use the law like Ray Comfort does, but he made them aware of what they had done and how wrong it was. But the thing is, Peter does not leave the crowd in their despair. He answers that question, what shall we do, with these words, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all who will call on the Lord our God, or let me repeat that, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Now there is a necessary action here, and the necessary action is this, that if we want to deal with our sin in an effective way, we have to repent of our sins and to be baptized. We don't want to talk about sin and repentance. To talk about sin and the need for repentance in this day and age is to suggest that you have done something wrong. People don't want to admit 
that they have done something wrong. Repentance is turning away from sin and turning to God and to the gift of forgiveness that is in Jesus Christ. If I can't talk about sin and if I cannot recognize my own sinfulness, how am I going to turn away from something that I don't recognize and turn to God and seek his forgiveness? One of the great disasters of the church in this generation is that we have lost the ability and the will to talk about sin in a meaningful way. You see, it's not a meaningful for us to stand here in the pulpit of the church and say, out there, you are all sinners. People who don't come to church, people who don't, you're sinners, you're evil. No, that's not the truth of Scripture. The truth of Scripture is, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have to learn how to speak about sin in a meaningful way, and we need to present the gospel in such a way that people feel compelled to repent and to turn to God for forgiveness that can be found in Him alone. That is the necessary action, to repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. The gift is the personal presence of the Holy Spirit given when you repent and believe. Every person who genuinely repents of their sins and turns to God for forgiveness receives the gift. When you read the book of Acts, you find that the Holy Spirit is present on every page. The boldness of the followers of Jesus can only be attributed to the Holy Spirit. How on earth did Peter stand up in front of that large crowd that day? Peter, who had run away from Jesus when he was crucified. How did Peter ever stand up and preach such a sermon on that day? Without knowing what he was going to preach, how did he do it? The boldness comes from the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. The miracles, wonders, and signs that are recorded in the book of Acts are the work of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing particularly special about any of those people that we see involved in the miracles. But the power of the Holy Spirit is there. Guidance for direction of the new church and its missions are from the Holy Spirit. I always love this section when Paul is out on one of his missionary journeys and uh, Luke, who is the author of the book of Acts, the human author of the book of Acts, is telling us about they had left the Galatian churches on their second missionary journey and they were wondering where they would go next. And so they're beginning along the road and they think they're going to be going to Ephesus and it says the Spirit prevented us from doing this. They thought they would go someplace else. The Spirit prevented them from doing it. They get to the shore. And Paul has that vision of the man in Macedonia. Come and help us. So God called them by the power of the Holy Spirit. He issued that direction. Don't go here. Don't go there. Do go here. And it's a step-by-step -step kind of direction. This gift was not just for those early believers. It is for all of us. It is the Holy Spirit that enables us and his church to do the work of God in this world. He will make us bold to speak for him. He will give us everything we need to do the mission he calls us to do. He will show us the way that he wants us to go. We just have to listen and then obey. And this promise is that it is true for everyone whom the Lord our God will call. There is an expansive nature to this promise. Do you notice it? It is for everyone 
whom the Lord our God will call. That means we're included in this promise. For we are part of the everyone whom the Lord our God will call if we have come to true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Here in this first Christian sermon ever preached, we have the gospel in a nutshell. It encourages us to practice evangelism as the early church did. We need to help people to see their sin and their need of a Savior. And we need to pray that the Holy Spirit may help us learn from this example and help us to be better equipped to be the witnesses that our Lord Jesus calls us to be. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our God, we thank you that we may come into this time. We thank you for your word that speaks to our hearts and to our lives. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that as we look at this example of the first message spoken on your behalf on that day of Pentecost, may we be your servants, your witnesses, to wherever you call us to go. I'm reminded of that song, Lord, that we just heard a few moments ago. Who will go? Who will answer the call? It's not always about going far away, Lord. Sometimes it's just going across the street to the food land and sharing a word about the Lord Jesus with someone in line ahead of us. Help us, the Lord, to be the kind of people that follow your example that you have laid out for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We invite you to join now in singing our last hymn, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Um, uh, or joining to stand, uh, silently singing, right? Oh, we can't sing? Okay. So please join us, stand and sing. <laughs> As we go, may we go with the blessing of Scripture. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. <laughs>